Another edition of the KSO Show from Tallgrass Tap House. It's just me and DY for now. Uh, but this is always presented to you by People State Bank and Legacy Insurance and Tallgrass Tap House, Harry's, and Bourbon and Baker. All sponsor the podcast, sponsor the site, and it's good stuff. So how you doing, DY? Doing good. Good to have the starters to, to begin the show. I know. The starters get to begin the show and possibly some reserves coming in later as Kurtz and uh, Dale, Matt Hall, are doing a YouTube live for Kurtz's YouTube and or I guess it's not alive. They're just recording it from his phone because he doesn't have enough subscribers. He's not KSO status. Sign up. <laughs> sign, sign up. Sign up. S- subscribe to Kurtz's YouTube and ours if you haven't yet. So uh, it's an easy click. It's free to do. But anyway, uh, a fun podcast. I think coming off of a win, first time you know f- for a while, it's because of buys and such. It was over a month. And think. over a month since we've been able to g- come on a podcast and talk some K State football after a win. So first, initial thoughts from the TCU game, uh, I mean, to be able to just put them out there on the, the podcast. It's interesting the way that they eliminated TCU's passing game, and they really did kind of eliminate TCU's passing game, almost to the point where it was kind of coaching malpractice uh-huh. on the part of TCU for trying to continue to throw when they were having so much success on the ground. I think that decision or the smarts or the lack thereof on TCU's part probably played a role in K-State winning. Yeah. You'll never apologize for a win. You take every one you get. They got it. Uh, seemed to really figure things out on the offensive side of the ball, I thought, too. Um, they had some explosive plays, and for being talking about the plays over 10 yards, over 20 yards, had a few of those uh, against TCU that they didn't have against Oklahoma yep. State and Baylor, so saw some improvement if you speak about it in that line and they also missed a couple so they could have had even more Mm -hmm. uh the one that comes to mind is white king gill wide open middle of the field i don't know if it was a post route or what route it was but he got behind the defense and you know skyler just overthrew him so there was also additional opportunities out there for the taking the one thing that they have to fix on both sides of the ball that i would have said is the same thing that chris climate said at his tuesday press conference offensively got to figure out a way to run the ball Mm -hmm. still didn't run the ball well against tcu uh, found some success throwing it, but running the ball was still had their issues. Um, and the issues were different than what yep. the issues were against Oklahoma State and Baylor. Against Oklahoma State and Baylor, they were able to kind of do the zone scheme pretty well and um, and not power. Against TCU, power is what worked mm-hmm. when they ran the ball. So Chris Klein talked about needing to run the ball and maybe figure out if they want to be a zone scheme or a gap team or a gap scheme team. Uh, so just to know their identity because – if you start going back and forth, then, then, then maybe you don't master mm-hmm. one. And I think he thought maybe they need to simplify it and master one of those things, and maybe they would see some success off of, off of that, uh, I guess, pivot. Defensively, uh-huh. just need a tackle. Yeah. Um, they That Dugan run. Oof. Yeah, that Max Dugan 48-yard touchdown run. <laughs> I think it was 48 yards. Probably the slowest 48-yard touchdown run we've seen yeah. in some time. <laughs> yep. uh, and kind of punked K-State's defense a little bit on that play. But the tackling has to be better because they were uh, gashed in the run game. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't because they weren't in the right spot. So yeah. They weren't in a position to make a play. They were. Uh, there's a lot of missed tackles. And then a few tackles they made, they were still getting drugged. So uh, that's what I would have said. That's what Chris Kleiman said on Tuesday. You know, need to run the ball and need to tackle better. So now it's the daunting task of Oklahoma on Saturday coming up, 11 o'clock kickoff. I mean, wh- five in a row for OU, by the way. Five 11 a.m. kicks in a row. That's interesting for oh, that's What's really weird is Texas is in those five games, too. You think a well, Texas OU game? They always play that game at noon. Or at noon they call Do it they not, really? Yeah, the big noon kick. That's uh, dumb, though. They just want to highlight Oklahoma in a time slot. And for some reason this year, Fox has decided because they have that Big 12 rights, or at least some Big 12 rights, they're going to put them at noon or, okay. or 11 a.m. Central yeah. time and hopefully get more eyeballs on to yeah. that. That's why this game's at 11 a.m., fifth one one in a row for the Sooners. And I mean, a good. Do you like 11 a.m. Game, 11 a.m. games as a person who covers the sport? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> you could give your take as well. I like it either the earliest time slot or the latest because if it's in the middle, that 2.30 kick, we don't get to see the, the early kickoffs yeah. and we don't get to see the late kickoffs. So we don't true. get to watch any college it's football true. really during a 2.30 kick. So as long as it's early, as long as it's late, I'm pretty happy. I think, which might be weird for me, I think I like the early more. I like the early Because, yeah, it gives you, once you can get your work done, you can have the evening. Yep. And, yeah, but I'm with you. If you had to choose the next one, make it late because then once you're done with your work, at the stadium, just go home, you sleep, and then wake up and do some more work. Not as much pressure to put it up right yep. away as well. but uh, And I think Kansas State might benefit from the 11 a.m. kick in this game. Uh, yeah. 
laminated kicks are notoriously harder to get up for, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you are the favorite and it's playing in, uh, on the road, especially probably in a place like Manhattan, Kansas, where um, you'd have to think if you want to catch Oklahoma sleepwalking at all or not playing the Ray game. An 11 a.m. kick in Manhattan after they already had four previous 11 yeah. a.m. kicks is probably the formula, the best formula one could come up with if you want Oklahoma not to play the Ray game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. So now... We, we saw, as you said, Coach Kleiman today. Today's Tuesday. We're recording this now. Might go up tomorrow morning. Might go up today. Might go up Friday. Who knows? <laughs> whatever Dale says, whatever Matt says when he comes on this pod is the law. But what did you hear from Kleiman as far as Oklahoma goes? Do, does it seem like this this team's going to have a, uh, at least fight for this this win? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to say. I, I think they understand how daunting of a challenge yeah. it's going to be. I mean, I remember – it was rattled off all the someone you know I think it was these guy French had rattled off all those stats to Chris Kleiman and at some point he was just like you know th- thanks for reminding me yeah. I mean, we've <laughs> seen plenty we've seen plenty on tape yeah. so they understand how daunting of a task it is but I do also think that they probably got a little impatient with continuously being asked you know about being the underdog which is a weird angle to take because uh, this isn't the first time this year they've been the underdog, yeah. so it's a weird. So I guess I'm surprised that people wanted to make a story out of being the underdog. They've been an underdog more than against Oklahoma this year, yep. and I don't think anyone's surprised that that they are the underdog. But um, but they're also not playing it up. Mm-hmm. Obviously, everyone's like, well, you know, they have so much to accomplish in this game. You could shock the world, you know. I, I, I think some coaches play that up, play that card up, so they try to get their team, you know, completely fired up and mm-hmm. up for for a game. Chris Kleiman doesn't really take that angle because if you really try to get your team up for one game, then what do you do the next? Yep. Because he wants his team up for every game, yep. so he doesn't just overemphasize it just because they have a a lot to play for in this game. They can shock the world, of course they can, but his players also know that, so I don't think he feels the need to re-emphasize it or to remind them they watch the tape they watch tv they listen to everyone they see stuff they Mm -hmm. read stuff they know oklahoma's good they've been good for a while yep and you've seen some oklahoma this year so let's start with what their most daunting thing is of course their defense has stepped up let's start with their offense and what k-state's gonna have to deal with on that side uh because jalen hurts He's been very good for Oklahoma this year. I mean, and then C.D. Lamb, so many guys, Kennedy Brooks, uh, Trey Sermon, Trey Sermon, so many guys. Talk about what this offense can do and how K-State's going to have to at least try to slow them down. Well, this <laughs> offense essentially can do whatever it wants. Yeah. I know that's broad, that's vague, uh, but I can't say, oh, hey, they're better at running the ball or, hey, they're better at throwing the ball or this guy's good or that guy's good. They're all freaking good, and they yep. can run the ball and they can throw the ball. They're averaging almost 10 yards a play. That's insane so the, so the, <laughs> essentially insane. they're almost getting a first down every time they snap the ball it's, yep. it's not going to be less than 10 yards um just ridiculous numbers so there's only a, so much i could say jalen hurts is a really good quarterback mm-hmm. guess what he's got really good teammates and they're going to get the ball and they're all good what they do is, does worry you if you're k-state in the sense that you have to tackle well if you want any want any shot at defending oklahoma because they play in space and what do you have to do in space you have to tackle in space Oklahoma is all about explosive plays. What's Kansas State kind of struggled with defensively this year? The explosive plays. So, it's, so aside from yep. Oklahoma just being a really good freaking team, it's hard to defend. Mm-hmm. They kind of play into Kansas State's weaknesses as a defense, so that kind of scares you a little bit, I would think, for, if you're the defensive coordinator, because I don't know that they've shored up their tackling. It certainly didn't seem like that against TCU. Uh, and they had the big plays as well, although they probably tempered the big plays a little bit against TCU. I think the mm-hmm. only one I can really think of in terms of at least over 20 yards yeah. would be the run by Max Duke. Yep. And it was they, all run. They didn't really pass the ball the, with big they, plays. They tried. Yeah, they, they, they tried. They, they but just they, sucked yeah. at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, but Jalen Hurts is a lot but, different yeah, than Jalen Hurts is a lot freshman. different. And, uh, no, they just, Oklahoma's going to get theirs probably on the offensive side. It's, it's hard to not to see them do that. I think uh, Chris Kleiman said that, hey, First and foremost, we probably want to stop their run. Yeah. Um, because that's where everyone thinks Oklahoma air raidy. Yep. Lincoln Riley yep. air raidy. want to throw the ball around the yard. But, and I heard Joel Clapp from Fox say this during an Oklahoma, during multiple Oklahoma games this year. And when he talks to opposing coaches, this is the best part of what they do 
is that they're so good at running the ball. Yep. And that's something that Lincoln Riley has implemented into his air raid scheme is an ability to run the ball because now you can't really pick your poison. Mm-hmm. And you have to. You're, you're going to get bit by something. You're going to choose what you want to get bit by. Uh, Kansas State probably wants to get bit by the pass. Yeah. What it's like Chris Kleiman because he wants – so you got to stop the run. Now you have to decide which running game you want to stop because they're going to do jet action. That can hurt you. They're, they can hurt you with Trey Sermon and then Kennedy Brooks out of the backfield, and Jalen Hurts can take off. And, of course, you know you wonder how much of a field day Jalen Hurts can have when Max yep. Dugan almost ran for – did he run for over 100 yards? I think so, yeah. For well, be... So, you know, you got to pick your poison. You hope you can start the whole run game, but there's actually different elements of the run game you have to stop. So it's a scary proposition for Kansas State, but – seems like they're going to try to stop the run game first and foremost. And it makes sense to me. because And if you look at the stats, and some of it has probably been good fortune, but some of it's because they played it well. I think Kansas State, you know, in terms of some of the categories you look at, is the number one pass defense in the Big 12 at this point, which is, you know, something to hang your hat yeah. on. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about a guy like uh, A.J. Parker? I think, what did you think from TCU? He obviously had that big P.I., pass interference, that he did have. But overall, what was his game like? And throughout the season because he's going to have to match up against a guy like C.D. Lamb, maybe the best pass catcher in the nation. Yeah, it's, it's hard to judge him because at first we're probably, and this is what happens, it's, uh, you know, you fall into a trap of cornerbacks, you really only remember their bad plays because they're good yep. plays. You don't really speak about that because, you know, they defeat, they win their matchup. Um, and they and the, every corner typically wins their matchup more than they lose it, uh-huh. but you only remember the ones they lose. I would say A.J. Parker's probably been had an uneven year, um, some uneven games. Um, his tackling is probably a little bit uh, – he's one of the repeat offenders when it comes to poor tackling. Yep. Uh, Max he, Dugan had that stiff arm on him. He was the victim of the Max Dugan stiff arm, Oof. so uneven. Now his coverage, I think, has been pretty good for the most part. Um, you remember the plays where he gets beat. Uh, I think he got hand, handled a little bit in the first half by Tylen Wallace, I think, when he had a huge first half. Yep. Uh, TCU didn't throw well, so you got to tip your hat to him in that way. But um, just an uneven year because he hasn't always he, – he's had some plays where he's gotten exposed yeah. a little bit. I think he bit a hard on a play action against Baylor when they beat him over the top in mm-hmm. the second half too. So you, you remember the bad plays, you don't remember the good plays. But there's been more good than bad, and he probably gets a bad rap. Um, but when it comes to tackling – um, he's one of the guys you think mm-hmm. of that probably needs to make a large improvement in what he's doing, no and so is Wayne Jones. And then let's talk about the linebackers a little bit because I think that's a group that, compared to last year, has stepped up. Obviously, having no Justin Hughes and him being the best guy there last year was important, but Daquan Patton struggled. You didn't have Elijah Sullivan. Now you have a Elijah Sullivan, Daquan Patton playing better, and a Daniel Green who is – Sometimes being asked, "Hey, is this is this the best linebacker on the team?" What do you think about that group? I I think some people maybe at times this year have overinflated the production from the linebacker position because, quite frankly, I think in terms of stopping the run and those explosive plays against Oklahoma State and again against Baylor, I think it was those misfits by those linebackers. I thought they played kind of poorly in those two games myself. Now I think they were pretty good against Mississippi State. And I think they were pretty good this past week against TCU. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's um, easy and it's common for freshmen to have to be the ones probably that are the victim of not fitting those runs the most. And I think that's what we've seen from Daniel yeah. Green. I think I know I forget, and I know many probably listening to this forget, he's still just a redshirt freshman. It seems like he's 25 years old, but he's not. <laughs> Now he's an older redshirt freshman, of course, but he's, he's still making considerable considerable improvement week to week. Yeah. Uh, now, his run fits were so much better against TCU, and I just remember c- calling it out, you know, drive after drive, hey, he hit that well this time, or he hit that well that time. I think we saw much more consistency from him and and fitting his runs. And what probably fell apart a little bit on him against TCU is Daniel Green hadn't been one of the, the worst defenders when it came to poor tackling, at least in prior games. He probably was against TCU, so as soon as he shored up one part of his game, another one started leaking. But that's what happens when you're a redshirt freshman. Now let's move down to the defensive line. Tell me about how great of a season Wyatt Hubert has had so far this year and just how impressive he's been, especially, I mean, just, just being how young he is still, too. He's been real impressive, and I think it would be a crime if he wasn't all Big 12 in some form. 
his first half against Oklahoma State was as good as any half I've ever I've seen from a Kansas State defensive player in the three years that we've covered the team since the existence of KSO. He was great in the fourth quarter against TCU, but that's only because we're only seeing production. We only see, we see production numbers in the fourth quarter against TCU. Yeah. We see production and numbers in the first half against Oklahoma State. Just because we didn't see numbers and production in those other quarters doesn't mean he's still not affecting the game. He still mm-hmm. lives. Quite frankly, he's literally probably the only player that every defense, offensive coordinator comes in and schemes against on an individual standpoint. Yeah. He's the one getting schemed against the most. So the fact that he's still able to find ways to be productive says a lot about him because no one else is getting schemed by an offensive coordinator the way that he is. So just the leaps and production from him. Now he needs to probably adjust a little bit when that comes to it because he can't completely disappear. Uh, he probably has a couple of times here and there, but sometimes people think he's disappeared when he's not. He's just uh, consuming and absorbing so much of the offense's uh, focus and concentration mm-hmm. that he is freeing stuff up for the other players. So s- some of Reggie Walker's numbers, some of Kyle Ball's yeah. numbers, some of Daquan Patton's numbers, Daniel Green's numbers, they're getting their numbers because of how much of a force that Wide Hubert has been. So when you just look at numbers, that doesn't tell the whole story. And I hate when people do that with the defense because, I mean, I remember – you know, and this is just what I know. A year, Joey Bosa, I think it was his sophomore year at Ohio State. His numbers weren't great, but he was still the best player on that defensive yeah. team. So you just you just can't look at stats and know what a guy's doing. Yeah, I mean, it's a similar situation because I, I personally would say why he was the best defensive player on K-State. He is, and every offensive coordinator will tell you that too, by the way. They've schemed and, and you know, ran their plays. So how much do you see him affecting this Oklahoma offensive line and getting into the backfield because that's going to be huge to to try to flush Jalen Hurts out and force him to make tough passes and and you also have to contain him so what's the job why he was going to have to do this weekend it'll be in the defensive line as a whole right defensive line as a whole and and I think the defensive line has played pretty good this year probably been their most consistent unit I know the pass defense is really good so it's like hey the secondary is the best unit on this team. The secondary is okay. It's been, they've done well. But some of that good pass defense is also because the defensive line's doing their job up front. So I think the defensive line's probably been their most consistent unit on the defensive side of the ball this year, at least from a production standpoint or being just being productive in general. The defensive tackles have been good as well. And I think Jordan Minnie's probably been the best one. I get to Oklahoma, it'll be interesting how they attack that offense because do you want to get after the passer? Because if you don't get home, Jalen Hurts is going to burn you for 80 yards. I mean, Max Dugan just burn you for 48. Yep, yep. So how much do you really want to rush him or flush him from the mm-hmm. pocket? Because I, I don't know how much if he can hurt you more outside the pocket or more yeah, inside the pocket. True. If he can hurt you more outside the pocket, then maybe you just you want, to, you want to keep him in the pocket um, and you know pick, just pick your poison from there and see what he does, and you just take your medicine at that point yeah. and just hope it, it works out in your favor. So it'll be interesting how much they rush the passer or do they just drop and – you know, keep a spy on him. And just maybe rush three, rush yeah. four. Keep a spy on him and put everyone else in coverage. It'll be interesting how they decide to attack it from from that standpoint. Um, their defensive line, they're going to ask a lot about a lot from them in the run game and probably in the pass game because they might be the only ones that they send. Yeah. At least a lot of the time. I know I would be as a defensive coordinator a little hesitant to rush the passer, especially when it's Jalen Hurts. But he's also going to pick you apart through the air as well. Yeah. So safe i mean to put it simple i don't know how you attack them really yeah no it's tough and before we flip to the other side of the ball let's touch a little bit and talking about breaking tackles and the ability to do it kennedy brooks and trey sermon they both offer a lot uh as far as that goes how difficult are they going to be to bring down in this game uh yeah probably a lot because they had a hard (laughs) time bringing down max dugan last week so uh, i can't imagine it's going to be easy now i I tend to think Trey Sermon's not really a yards after contact guy, and, and the, the stats probably say I'm, I'm wrong in that, but uh-huh. Kennedy Brooks seems much more difficult and more complicated to play against just for my naked eye than Trey Sermon. I've been kind of down on Trey Sermon, but Ke- Oklahoma continues to play him a lot, so I'm probably stupid. But Kennedy Brooks scares me more. I don't know about you. No, I think uh, he does me too. I mean, he had a, a higher um, uh yards per carry i'm pretty sure last year than trey sermon even so and one of the highest in the country maybe the highest in the country last oh, great year. matt hall's back i know and, and matt hall has joined the show perfect timing as we Trey's switch oh is he gonna uh, yes who scares you more going. just for a little bit well Ken- kennedy brooks or trey sermon fortunately i was just on kurtz's youtube channel talking about this and <laughs> kurtz had the stats pulled up kennedy brooks i'm with i'm with you 
But I mean, we're looking at the stats over there. They're all terrifying. I mean, right. and, and Kurtz can correct me, but Kennedy Brooks, where was he? He's over eight yards a carry, I think. Well, no, they were all he was over, over seven. He was over seven. They were between Trace, seven and nine. Trey Sermon was over seven. Ramondre, Ramondre, Ramondre I can't. I ne- Ramondre. Ramondre. I used to talk to him. Remember when he was at Cerritos yeah. and Case? He was a very nice kid. He's averaging over nine. Jalen Hurts is averaging over eight. And so, they all have at least 39 carries. Right, and none of these guys are on low carries, too. So you're right. When you say that Sermon's not as much, he, he's a different yards after contact guy. Kennedy Brooks might break your tackle and score. Trey Sermon is going to bowl you over and then get four more like Alana Lula was. You know, for So I agree with you, but they're all they're all fantastic I, backs. Yeah, I've just I mean, never been terrified of Trey Sermon, but I should be. I know terrified of all of them. But Kennedy Brooks is the one that would terrify me the most. And we were talking, you know, how to – kind of attack Oklahoma's offense or what you would do. And obviously Chris Kleiman's talked about taking away the run, and I think that's smart. That's probably the thing to do, especially when Kent State is the number one pass defense in the Big 12 and some some stats that you look at, which is a, a little surprising, of course. But if you, if you feel like you have that kind of secondary, and so far they've shown to do that, then of course you probably want to put more emphasis on stopping the run. But it, in terms of rushing Jalen Hurts, I would be terrified to do it. Yeah, I would be too. I, and I, I'm with you. I think it's the right thing to do because – I'm going to simplify football really much. Like, if you're playing, you know, if you and me are playing one-on-one football in the backyard, you know, and, like, there's one – how do I say this? If I'm playing one-on-two football against you and Flanders, right, and you have the ball, well, I better run up to you and try to stop you because the only chance I have is that hopefully you throw it and Flanders doesn't catch it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the most simplified way of it is. So if you're playing an offense like Oklahoma, and they can do either – you got to pick. You better stop the run first because at least then you take the chance that Jalen Hurts is inaccurate throwing the football, that a ball gets tipped, that interceptions happen, that the, the passing game is just off rhythm. So I do agree with the idea of stopping the run first because if you don't, like the stats have shown, like Hurts and I talked about, they're going to rip off 10 yards every single carry. But that said is how do you do it? And then two with Jalen Hurts, how much pressure do you want to put on him? Because as many times as he's carried the ball that Kurtz talks about, I mean, I wouldn't say he wants to pull it down because he's a very good passer, but he's happy to pull it down and run the football. The problem is, and to stop the run, you have to kind of put more in the box, right? Uh And if Oklahoma goes to a pass, then you're screwed. When you talk about the, the missed tackle issues and stuff, you know, I mean, they've been scary. And I'm not trying to just, you know, say, I'm not trying to just, uh, kiss Oklahoma's backside for the entire week and I usually get tired of it but against Charleston Rambo you know against uh against CD Lamb against Kennedy Oof. Brooks like if you have the box stacked and then they get it one you know they throw a slant out there and one guy misses a tackle we saw it last year I mean it's just touchdown after touchdown that's why that's why it's tough and we've seen it with OU this year with CD Lamb getting right. touchdown after touchdown and yeah, yeah. And yeah. Kennedy yeah. Brooks and all these weapons and you got to get home if you go after her so there's just no chance you Gosh. have to play perfectly on defense yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something to add, you know. I don't know. Get like five turnovers. I mean, right. that, that would that'll help. have to be it, right? Like, <laughs> right. yeah, just, but that yeah, and you have to take risks to do it. So you're going to get those turnovers, or you're going to give up 50 points. And, and if you're listening to this, and you guys can all add to this too, like, and I just jumped in halfway through, like, this is not a we're knocking K State edition yeah, of the, no. Like, I I it's think just this crazy. I think Lincoln you. Riley, the Oklahoma offense. I don't want to say it's the best offense in football because the Chiefs' offense, you know, oh, yeah. at its level is is as tough or tougher to stop but relative to its level of football the Lincoln Riley Oklahoma offense is as hard to stop and when you go Baker Mayfield Heisman first pick Kyler Murray Heisman first pick now Jalen Hurts may not do those things because just the odds are he won't but I mean you could sit here and argue he's been better than those two you know I mean so when I when we talk about how hard it is for K-State to stop him if we were Texas right now, we'd be doing the same thing. If we yeah. were, you know, it's not about K-State not being good enough. It's just this is a uniquely good offense. Well, and I will say, if we're talking about chances to stay in the game, like Baker Mayfield came to Manhattan two years ago, right. and K-State was definitely in that game. I mean, they Tied found a way. Tied minutes left, right? Yeah. So. And Oklahoma hasn't had that game yet this season. So if they already had, then I'd be like, well, we're probably not going to get that game from them. But they haven't stubbed their toe at all. Now, you can still stub your toe and win. That's probably what's going to happen to Oklahoma at some point this season. But if they haven't done it up to this point, then maybe that game's still left. And the formula for that to happen would be an 11 a.m. kick in the middle of Kansas. Yeah, and that's – I mean, Vegas sure seemed to agree, right? Yeah. Because – Lowest line of the year, didn't you say? Outside, outside of Texas. Texas. Oh, sure, outside of yeah. Texas, it was the lowest – now, I had seen today, it looks like it's gone up to 24 or something from where it was originally at 21. Or even 19 and a half is where I saw one line open. So Vegas it sure opened. seems to think that uh, yeah. it opened it, at 19 and a half. It opened at, at 
19 half then it's then it kind of went up then back down and now it's gone up again so it opened as the second closest line for Oklahoma this year I'm not sure it's going to finish at that yeah which you can understand everybody looking at that and thinking like okay yeah but you know if, if you're Vegas yeah you're right 11 a.m kickoff at K-State they didn't play all that well here the last time that they were here it is like I think there's still some residual like you know Bill Snyder 2.0 Manhattan's yeah. a tough you know, and I don't say this to run down Bill Snyder Family Stadium or anything like that, but I, I think there's a residual effect from like the 11-12 run, where it's a tougher place to play than perhaps it actually is. I feel the same. Um, but you know, there was like the 2015 TCU game. I mean, we've seen this happen before Oklahoma to some State, of these the high-powered teams. I mean, they weren't that good, but Oklahoma State, yeah. right, right. Oklahoma State last year. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. So we've talked offense. I mean, unless you guys have anything else you want to add, we do kind of want to flip to the other side of the ball. K- yeah, K State's defense. Yeah, so we had talked about K State. Talk about K State. Yeah, we're talking about Oklahoma offense, K State defense. Let's talk a little bit about this Oklahoma defense that I think's been better than years prior. They've slowly gotten better, better over the years. But why is this defense better now than they've been in the past? Uh, they're they're better probably just because they've tackled better. They're not making the stupid plays that it's out there. They're playing faster. Um, I, th- I think if you listen to guys like Joel Klatt and, and what he's heard from defensive coordinators and what we heard again from today from head coach Chris Kleiman is that they've probably simplified things better to the point where they can think less and play faster. And I think that's probably the gist of what they've done. Now, it is an incredibly better defense if you compare it to last year or even the year before. But it still isn't great if you actually look at their per play and per drive numbers. They're mm-hmm. still middle of the road Big 12. So it's great for their standards, yeah. but it's not an elite unit. What is K-State going to have to do to attack this defense? Well, I mean, I think they're going to have to do it through the air a lot. Because, yeah. one, I think Oklahoma's offense is so good that I, I can't imagine Oklahoma not getting into the 40s, the high 30s, low 40s in this game. If that's the case, I don't think K-State's going to pile up 35 to 42 points running James Gilbert 35 times or 40 times. I'm not saying ignore the run because that's what K-State's identity is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think there's just too much speed laterally side to side. And a lot of it coming with Kenneth Murray. I mean, we've all watched yep. him play for Oklahoma. I mean, you watch that Texas game. I put in one of our group messages or on Twitter or somewhere. Like, I swore the guy runs a 3-9 in pads. I mean, so the point is you're going to have to use their speed against them mm-hmm. some with misdirections and draws and screens and crossing routes and et cetera. Got really quiet. <laughs> and... Um, and, but I, I don't know that there is a thing that's going to be successful enough. Like D.Y. said, this is not an elite defense, but it's a good defense. Uh-huh. And when you have a good defense and elite offense, it's just going to be really hard um, to stick with them. But I, I think it's going to have to come in the short passing game, which is something I wanted to see some last week, and they had some success with it, and I hope they can do it again. Tough part is, like, you think about controlling the ball and possessing the ball and controlling the clock and all this stuff, like – they're not able to do that right now right. against really anybody in the Big yeah. 12. So, like you say, you know, the identity is running the football. And if you looked at the stats, like, there's, they still bear out that that's probably the case. But, like, man, I don't know. In Big 12 play, it kind of hasn't, hasn't been. been. I mean, right. they just have not really been able to do it. So, I think some mix of quite a bit of passing yards is going to have to be the case if you're going to score with them. I mean, there's just – there's no other really way that they can move the ball right now. Like, I'm not – the stuff with James Gilbert and Harry Trotter is just not really working. I mean, they can't run very well at all that way. I thought the one criticism of it, if you read between the lines today from Chris Kleiman, is he doesn't think they're simplifying it enough on that side of the ball in terms of the run game. Because when he was talking about – he was asked what things they need to get better at the rest – you know, the, the remainder six games – he talked about running the ball and tackling. Now we were talking about running the ball. And he said we need to figure out if we're a gap scheme or if we're a zone scheme because they, they had gap meaning power. Mm-hmm. They had struggled and couldn't really run power against Oklahoma State or Baylor. Maybe it had something to do with the premium run, of course. But they did have more uh, success running power rather than zone against TCU. And I think he's was kind of inferring, if you really look into what he said, that you know we're not mastering anything. We're just you know, you know throwing – things at the wall and hoping it sticks and just kind of I think he wants to settle on one of those and hang their hat on it and master it and then he thinks that will help the run game a little bit more obviously since Jordan Brown went down he didn't have a great game against Oklahoma State but how much has that affected the running game and just having to change a pace back I think it's definitely affected the running game in K-State's offense and you're right like he he didn't have a particularly good game or game good game at all against Oklahoma State one thing we saw him do and he he put the ball on the ground, but, you know, he got open out of the backfield for what had been a 20, 30-yard gain, and that's what we've always kind of thought his skill his skill is. You know, the last game he played before that at length was against Mississippi State where he had 
the muff punt, but he also had a seven yard touchdown run and a 17 yard run. Mm-hmm. I just think, and I know you guys all agree, it's a game where um, you're going to absolutely need explosive plays any way you can find them. I think outside of Malik Knowles, and, yeah. and maybe I'm not giving enough credit to guys like Youngblood and Schoen and Phillip Brooks and whatnot, but outside of Malik Knowles, I still think Jordan Brown's their second best offensive playmaker. So I don't know if the run game necessarily yeah. would be significantly more successful against Oklahoma if if uh, if uh, Jordan Brown were playing, but I think K State's offense would have another yeah. another threat. I just and what we heard today, you know, they're going to check him out Wednesday, and we'll see from there. Um, but I'd be surprised. I mean, again, this isn't reporting, like I said, on Curtis's thing. I'd just be surprised, I guess, if Jordan Brown played. But I don't think it's impossible. It would just allow them to be a lot more creative, yeah, right? right, with the offense, more so than being able to run the ball. Like, you can do so many more different things with Jordan Brown because of his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. So I think that's really the thing. Because Joe Irvin have one carry. I don't think he got a carry. He got like one, one snap. Yeah, like he think. played one snap. Was in the diamond formation. And it was more of a decoy. Than right. They sent him out to the left in the flats for like a little little dummy pass. Not a dummy pass route, but a fake pass route to yeah. people in tension. And yeah. And I, I think we would agree. Like had Jordan Brown been healthy, he right. would have played more than one snap. So I, I mean, so. as excited as we are about Joe Irvin down the line in the future, I mean that tells you I think where both of those two guys stand. I, I understand the thought that because of what what. what that's transpired the last three games in, in Big 12 play that the pass that they kind of are going to have to lean on that if they're going to have any success against Oklahoma that makes total sense to me but I don't think they have a chance of keeping it close without running the ball because I think part of the trick of playing with Oklahoma is probably giving them as few possessions as possible if you want to keep the game close no doubt yeah and then talk about Malik Knowles a little bit and obviously he had to play with the brace last week and he had a nice catch but how much has that affected him his injury and slow down his ability to make big plays i think last week it affected him probably tremendously just because you know as kurtz asked coach climate in post game he clearly was on a pitch count yeah. i mean so for one he only played half the game because of his injury two i mean i know we saw i can think of two instances where i thought he went to the turf um maybe not due to the injury i don't know if that's fair to say but that was surprised by that i thought was probably affected by the brace or the knee all that said he was still a factor i mean he had a huge catch on a third and very long down the left sideline had a big catch, another big catch on the touchdown drive, and two well, two catches I think on the touchdown drive. One on yeah. the one when they were just getting out of the shadows of their own goalposts. So, mm-hmm. um, I think he still makes a very, very big difference. I find it hard to believe he'll suddenly be a hundred percent, even yeah. though I know he's told people that he is or whatnot. No, no, um, hunted, hunted. I can't say. I don't, I, I don't know how to say that. So, um, but my, my gut tells me. I mean, if he played 20, 25 snaps last week and he looked relatively good doing it, barring setbacks this setbacks this week, why would he not get a little bit better? I think we'll see a closer. 200% version of Malik Knowles, and that's a big difference for K-State's offense. I also love their usage of him. They knew that pitch count last week. I think he got 21 snaps, but 17 were in the second half, so I thought right. they really paced that out perfectly. And then let's talk a little bit about special teams and talk about receivers a little bit too, and Joshua Youngblood seems like he's taking the reins as the uh, the guy to take punts back there. I mean, what do you think of that? you think he can make something happen? He's obviously... I think very smart at making sure when to fair catch and such, but what have you thought about that? I wrote earlier, and it was a story that posted earlier Tuesday morning, but I wrote that I think at some point he's going to break one. It just really seems like it because he plays at a different speed. I keep saying that, but it just looks different when Joshua Youngblood runs as opposed to 99% of the rest of the roster runs. Yeah. And I think at some point there's going to be – the hole's going to be there, and it's going to be open long enough where he's just going to dart through it, kind of like Malik Knowles did against Mississippi State. It would surprise me if that didn't happen, but I think I'm probably more impressed that he hasn't had a freshman mistake yet as a returner and uh, showed a lot of maturity in that way. Now, knock on wood, I hope I didn't just jinx him, but he's, he's been smart. <laughs> jinx. Yeah, I mean, I, is it crazy to say I feel a little bit better with him back there than Phillip Brooks? I, I don't think it is because you saw I don't think it's crazy at all. I think it's a fun conversation because yeah, to me they're two totally different type of return mm-hmm. guys. Like yeah. Youngblood, I think the difference to me, and this is what Derek said, is like is his acceleration. I don't know that he runs a, any, an exceptionally fast right, 40 so or whatnot, either. but I mean when he gets the ball, he's running at top speed, and that's unique for K-State's roster. Where Phillip Brooks is maybe a higher top in speed, I don't know for a fact if he does yeah. or doesn't, Phillip Brooks is so unique. I've never, never is a strong word. I've rarely seen a guy who's not a great athlete, doesn't have like elite speed, be so hard to get to the ground, you know, at that size. So slippery. So they're so different. But I would, I think there's a better chance of Youngblood 
breaking one for sure. Right. I think maybe maybe by definition, I could see Brooks being a better return man and having a higher average on returns and that kind of stuff. But yeah, if I need to score one, absolutely think Joshua Youngblood's a better better option for that. Youngblood's definitely giving you the big play, but if you're going probably by average yards per return, I bet Brooks would end up with a with a higher one. Now they do say Brooks is one of the fastest guys on the team. It still shocks me. So I imagine that. He's a little bit slower when he puts the pads on, and he's a smaller guy. It makes sense. But Joshua Youngblood, without pads, with pads, his speed doesn't really change. And here's a fun question for special teams. I mean, it's it's interesting to ask this, but a lot of people have. Is Devin Ankle the MVP of this team so far through however many games it's been? And, I mean, yeah, talk about that. No, he's not. I mean, I've seen, I've seen the question, and I understand <laughs> yeah. it, and I get it because it's to respect how good he has been, and he's been very, very good. But, to be, you know, and I'm not picking on you either. No, but if, yeah. you're being, if you're asking the question literally to be the MVP as a punter, <laughs> you've got to be, you know, the best punter in the country, and he could be, and you've had to have won games. Yeah, exactly. You know? I mean, and he has impacted them winning games, mm-hmm. no doubt about it. But, no, he wouldn't be in my top four or five, you know, yeah. for K-State's MVP. Um, but I think he's been very, very good this year. Yeah, same. And, and some of it's because your impact is limited as the punter, of course. He he impacts the game, but probably not and probably not more than Evan Curl, who gets 50 more snaps than he does. Right. That's what yeah. it comes Correct. down to. Who, how do you handicap that race right now, K-State's MVP? <laughs> I mean, Skylar Thompson would be the <laughs> yeah. MVP to me. I think so, too. Um, I think, you know, White Hubert, Trey Deshaun, Jordan Mitty. Um, Offensively, I would – Actually, and I know it's crazy. Malik Knowles, but but, but because of the difference yeah. with and without him, I think it's Malik Knowles. I, I would agree, yeah. actually. And I, look, I am Skyler guy right yeah. here, right? Like I I love Skyler, but I, I think it's those two, yeah, neck and neck. But yeah, we and part of this is we haven't seen. It may not be fair to Skyler because we haven't seen what the offense looks like if he goes out and then it's Nick Ost. Yeah, uh, you know? right. It's right, I, I'm pretty Skyler. confident Skyler's more valuable to this team than Malik Knowles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, because of that, I mean. Um, and for me to give an MVP, you've got you've got to have production, you mm-hmm. know. But I mean, I think it's okay. Malik Knowles is certainly one of the most important players. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't have him. I mean, he's got what five, ca- ten catches this year for a hundred. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. have him in my top ten of the MVP. But, yeah, and one of his yeah. his best plays is is the, the return. yeah punt kick return, return. Right. kick return against yeah. Mississippi State. That I mean, yeah, it was huge and was part of the reason they won that game. But but I I'm like you, I, I think. But I like D.Y. bringing up Evan Curl, too, just for example, yeah. because I think it's real. And not to, it's not to take away from Devin Ankle. That's not the point. Yeah. But it becomes real easy to say, oh, let's give it to Devin Ankle or Blake Lynch or whatever. It's like, hey, man, there are other guys who we're not talking about a lot, you know, who are playing, yeah, like Adam Holtor played 400 snaps, yeah. you know, on offense at center this year. He's probably more valuable to yeah. this team's success so far than a player who's played 10 snaps. Yeah. But, I mean, I but I mean, that's uh, – I understand the question. Yeah, and sure. it's something we didn't yeah. bring up when we were talking defense and stuff, but it, we we're talking special teams now too, so I guess it fits in. Is Jonathan Alexander had the nice punt block. Uh, Kleiman said he might like to get him more in on defense. What it, what have you thought from him as far as special teams goes and then defensively possibly seeing him more? He's just got – he's a player that probably has a nose for the ball or a penchant for the big play because he's – had fewer snaps than a lot of a lot of guys that are playing ahead of him but in those fewer snaps he's probably had more game changing plays than yeah. they have he had the uh, the scoop and score and was it week one I think it the, was yeah yep. week one and then last week the pump block and, and and he recovered it now if Lance Robinson recovers it it's probably a touchdown <laughs> yeah. so uh, no he's he's a big playmaker and I prop and that probably skill that ability that just penchant to that is probably why they want to get him on a few more no doubt I think it's time to pick this game. I mean, I don't think there's any better time to do it than right now. Um, so yeah, number five Oklahoma coming into Manhattan. The line was uh, it's. I'm looking at 23 and a half is the line right now. So <laughs> shot up a little bit. <laughs> if if we're going to pick this game, let's 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 talk about what K State has to do to try to win it and a score, and then yeah. So am I Chris. picking against the spread, or am I just picking uh, the just, game? Just pick the game. Final score prediction, yeah. what's going to happen, that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, God, it's real early in the week for that. Um, is it an omen that as I'm getting ready to say that, I just heard something break back there in the kitchen? Um, <laughs> it's true. I'll say uh, Oklahoma 48, K-State 23, something like that. And I feel like that's a somewhat optimistic view on it. That maybe that is Oklahoma being a bit sluggish in an 11 a.m. game here, and K State being able to do some things, and I, I take that and run with it. To yeah. be honest, I would say Oklahoma starts starts slow, ends well, 
uh, K State maybe gets a big play or so, just one, one, maybe two, but wins. But Oklahoma wins. Sorry, 40, <laughs> 44, 20. It's very, very similar. I think I have forty-one seventeen will be the final that I have. Um, I, I think it's a competitive game for a period of time. I don't even want really to put a time frame on when that stops, you know, because I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But I think Oklahoma is just significantly better. Uh, I don't think K-State losing by 24 would be a sign of anything bad, you know, against Oklahoma. But, uh, you know, I, there's no reason going into it other than just hoping the team lets down for me to suggest anything other than an Oklahoma blowout, you know. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going Oklahoma blowout as well. 40 to 20. <clears throat> um, K-State might keep it close in the first quarter, but, yeah, I think eventually Oklahoma just blows it out. Um, it's only three other games in the Big 12. Let's just go through them real quick. The first one is Texas headed to Fort Worth to take on the Horned Frogs. Obviously, we just saw K-State take down the Horned Frogs. Mm, I mean, I think uh – I think te- did it? Did I see the TCU is the favorite in that game? Can TCU is the a line? favorite. Uh, Texas, I'm seeing by one right now. Well, it opened no. at TCU minus two. I know that. That's because Texas without nine starters on defense. Uh, I still think Texas wins that game. I do. I think Texas wins. I'll take TCU. I don't think Texas Ooh. is very good. So I like that. I'll take TCU. I don't think TCU is very good either. But I think Texas is going in the wrong direction. I like that pick. I'm, I'm going to take Texas. Um, Ugly game. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. And now a couple, the last two games I think are are uh, some interesting ones. Oklahoma State headed to Iowa State. It is an interesting one. I mean, I on the road right now it's hard to predict Oklahoma State to win a game like that on the road with uh, Spencer Sanders being pretty up and down. So I'll, I'll take Iowa State. Iowa State in a shootout. I think Iowa State blows them out. Yeah, yeah I would Love say it. Iowa State fairly comfortably. Yep. I, I'm going to say the same thing. Yep. Uh, Texas Tech at KU. Yeah, I know this is like Kansas, you know, thinks that I'm, I'm going to take Texas Tech. I don't I don't think Kansas backs up what they did at Texas with quite the same energy and enthusiasm in this game. I just don't feel like they're ready quite as a program to really do that and that they're going to have some games where they do things like what they did at Texas. I, I don't think they will win that game. They're not duplicated. They probably got way up for that game because I think Les Miles is the opposite of Chris Kleiman where I think he overemphasizes games and mm-hmm. plays them up. I think he did that last week. I see Tech big. I just have a real bad handle. I mean, KU's bad. Like I, but I just have a real bad handle on them. I feel like I've, I thought you know, there's times like I thought they'd get hammered at Boston College. And they won, I mean, Boston College isn't good either, but then they won by a million. I thought they'd play kind of close with Texas, but not have them beat at one point. If I can, so I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'm going to pick Texas Tech though because I think these guys are right. I just I don't think they are can do this on a week to week basis. They've had some weeks where TCU beat them by a million. I mean, so um, I would take Texas Tech, but I don't feel great about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm going to take Texas Tech handedly, but that's just how I roll when it's KU. I know you do. <laughs> I mean, never, never. <laughs> hey, you're usually right. <laughs> We had Big Four champs right last year, you know, because KU didn't win it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, now let's – I want to finish up this podcast by talking about how important was that TCU win for K-State, obviously going into an Oklahoma win, and then how much do you think – or your prediction on K-State making a bowl game this year? I think it was big. I think it was, I said, not an insignificant win. It was a significant win because it takes a little bit of the pressure off going into Lawrence in a couple of weeks, which – Right or not, that's going to be the biggest game of the year for K-State, the game that they have to win. And I did, I do think that paved the way for them to reach a bowl game. I think they get there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate, I guess, to pick six wins before the season, uh, even though I was being a little bit probably too positive and to believe it. But same thing, I've sold six wins. I don't think it was a must-win to go to a bowl game. I said that before. Uh-huh. I said it would really help. You know, it helps to uh-huh. win games to go to bowl games and get to six. I don't think they had to win it. But I think their chances would have dropped 20, 30 percent if they'd lost it. So significantly big win for sure. Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, they still had an outside chance without the win. But I'd, I'd say right now they're still trending towards six. I, I'm right around the same thing. So, I mean, hey, this weekend should be fun regardless. We got yeah. basketball to watch on Friday. K-State in their first exhibition game against Washburn. That's going to be fun to watch. Um, and then Saturday, we get to see some more football. So. Um, from Tallgrass Tap House, this was the KSO show presented by Legacy Insurance and People State Bank. Harry's Bourbon and Baker go to all of those places. Very good. They sponsor the podcast and they're very nice to us. So, without further ado, for John Kurtz, Derek Young, Matt Hall, don't forget to.
tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs>